Good afternoon, everybody. A warm welcome from a sunny Johannesburg. Welcome to the Impact Africa Social Entrepreneurship Virtual Summit. My, my name is Ntunyana Kisa today, and I will be your host this afternoon for this webinar. We're hoping that you're going to learn a lot. You're going to enjoy the speakers that we have lined up for you. There's a lot of insight that we'd like to introduce and a lot of knowledge that we'd also like to get back from you. So, why this virtual summit? As you all know, we've had three previous summits that have been hosted in three different countries. The first one was in Ghana, the second one was in South Africa, the third one was last year in Kenya, and now, because of the situation that we are under, we're having it hosted under the World Wide Web. And therefore, we are so happy that so many of you are able to join us this afternoon. The Impact Africa Social Entrepreneurship Summit is a partnership between us, the British Council, and also Ashoka Africa. We felt that there was a need to have a platform, as we have done previously, to showcase and to provide a knowledge sharing area for all social enterprises and social entrepreneurs out there in the ecosystem. And thus, we know that under all of the, the, the current pandemic challenges and situations that we've had, we thought this year we will not miss it. We would love to hear what our social entrepreneurs have been going through, the challenges that they're experiencing, and thus we termed it sustainability and resilience because we'd like to know how our social enterprises are being resilient and how do they see sustainability going forward in their enterprises. Having said that, I would like to say going forward, we want to have another summit which will be held face to face. This will be in Nigeria next year. But during this year, we will have many sessions and many opportunities for you to interact with us. On a monthly basis going forward, beginning with this one, we will have opportunities for you to speak to us, for us to have webinars where we will host different speakers around different topics that still speak to social entrepreneurship overall. May I please just also ask you to make sure that you are hashtagging Impact Africa 2020, please, on any and every social media platform that you have. Let's get that conversation going. Let's get the engagement going. Let's get the excitement going. If you'd like to also, during the, the time of this webinar and also during the next few months, look at what webinars are coming up, what opportunities you can engage further with us, you're welcome to go to our impactafricasummit.net website. On there, you will find all of the information about all of the webinars that are upcoming. Please do engage with us further. Do give us your feedback on the website. And also, we, we ask you to delight in this opportunity, delight in this webinar that we have with you today. And please, there's the comment section, as always. Make sure that you put your comments in there, your opinions. But I always ask, let's be respectful of each other's opinions, but let's also be open about the challenges that exist out there. Let me now get to the exciting part of the webinar and introduce to you the speakers that we have this afternoon. We have Ms. Olua Shen Osuobi. She'll be coming in as the Executive Director of Stand to End Rape Initiative in Nigeria. We have Mr. Daniel Dick Jr., the founder of the Teens for Change Foundation, also based in Nigeria. And we have Ms. Ntapo Majibi, who is the founder of the Southern Africa Association for Social Entrepreneurs. She's based in South Africa. And we have Mr. Yamin Kowe, who is the founder of Sustainable Cities Africa. He's coming to us from Botswana. And finally, we have Mr. Olua Femi Dahunsi, who is the founder of Teens World Empowerment, and he's also based in Nigeria. I would like to give them a warm welcome. They are looking forward to sharing their insights around the challenges the social entrepreneurs are facing as we speak to now, as we speak to you today, and also as we, we have gone through the past few months of the COVID-19 challenge. Let me first introduce our first speaker, Ms. Oluwa Shen Osowobi, and invite her to the screen so she can give you a background of the fantastic work that she does in her organization and also give you a little bit of insight of who she is and why she decided to take on the social entrepreneurship um, passionate drive that she's on. Ms. Oluwa Shen, you're more than welcome. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Oluwa Shen Ayodeji Osowobi and I'm the executive director of Stand to End Rape Initiative, which I founded in 2014 as a response to a personal experience I had and um, my understanding of the gaps in terms of preventing and responding to issues of sexual and gender-based violence in Nigeria. I've been doing this work now for about six years and it's been very interesting, but also very tough. Good to be here. 
Makirinaji, thank you so much. We look forward to hearing a lot about the initiatives that you've been doing in your organization, and we welcome you once again. Please allow me the pleasure to now welcome Mr. Daniel Digg Jr., who is the founder of the Teens for Change Foundation. A warm welcome, Daniel. We'd love to hear about you and the work that you do. Hi, thank you so much for having me. My name is Dick Junior, and I grew up from the slum. Um, you know, growing up from the slum, there's a lot of challenges, and that led to me founding the, the, my foundation called the Things for Change. And what we do is what a family of global change makers who are taking a stand against the increasing rate of out of school street children in Africa. And we are doing this through empowering them through education and educational skills training. Hi, hi, Daniel. I, I didn't catch that last that last sentence that you had. Please, may you just repeat it for us? I don't want, so want us My to miss anything. Okay, that's yes. fine. That's the new age. age. <laughs> okay, so my name is Genio. I'm the founder of the Teens for Change Foundation. I grew up from the slum, and growing up from the slum was very difficult. I, I saw the whole challenges growing up while I was young lost a lot of my friends through, through gun violence and a lot of stuff. So um, growing up in 2016, I said to myself, there has to be a change. And that was when I started the Teens for Change Foundation. And we, what we do basically is to provide um, educational access to street kids from slum communities and also empower them through vocational skill training. Thank you so much, Daniel. That sounds like a very heartwarming story. I cannot wait to hear about your insights, the journey that you've traveled to get to where you are around this. Can I then also give a warm welcome to Ms. Nsapo Majibi, who is the founder of the Southern Africa Association for Social Entrepreneurs. A warm welcome to you, Ms. Nsapo. Um, thank you so much, Tonyana, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zako Majibi, and I'm the founder of SAS, as mentioned, which is an, a nonprofit organization that aims to train and develop so, um, unemployed graduates to be social entrepreneurs. And I identified this gap with the increasing unemployment in South Africa. I think we have a niche market that we can use graduates to actually develop them to social entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nsapo. Thank you so much. As I'm saying to every speaker, there's so much. What we love about the, the, the array of speakers we have today is it's fr they're from different areas, doing different components, but they've all decided to take on a passionate reform. And thus, this is what we want to hear. What drives social entrepreneurs in these trying times that we're in? May I please welcome also Mr. Yami Kowe, who is the founder of Sustainable Cities Africa. You're more than welcome, Mr. Yami. Hello and good afternoon to everyone who's listening in on this. Uh, my name is Yami Nkwe. I'm the founder of Sustainable Cities Africa, as introduced. Basically, my, my vision or what we are working at here in, at, at Sustainable Cities Africa, based here in Gaborone in Botswana, is basically to tackle the twin issues that are actually most pressing for Africa, which is our rapid, unsustainable urbanization and climate action. So basically, we just basically wanted to see how we can actually bring an African narrative to this conversation about how can we better put people, climate action and economy at the heart of uh, developing our city so that they're people focused, they are inclusive in terms of the economic opportunities that they generate, and more specifically, try to address climate action, but from an Af African con context. So we are, we've been hard at work since about 2015, 16, trying to get to government on board to actually say, look, this is possible not only in Botswana, but as a vision for not only Southern Southern Africa, but also as a model for Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic, Yami. You're more than welcome to do this afternoon's session. And last but not least, may I please welcome Mr. Oluani Femi Dahunsi. He is the founder of Teens World Empowerment, and we'd love to find out what your work is about and what got you onto this special passionate drive. Welcome. Hello everyone, I'm Dan Silvani Femi, and then I started my organization Teens World Empowerment in 2016 because I strongly believe that the world wouldn't change until we raise the next generation of young leaders. Teens World Empowerment is aimed at eradicating lack of quality education by empowering young people to take action. 
Thank you. Short and sweet. I love that. But I'm hoping to get much more from you, Oluan Femi. Um, I want to find out your perceptions, your view, because I think what everybody's noticed this afternoon, we've got a very young, young present presenter speaking to us, young people, young speakers. We'd love to hear the young voice because I think a lot of what's coming and bubbling up now is that young people want to have a voice and young people also have some of the solutions of the future. Now, I believe we're going to get everybody on the screen now so that we can start the, the, the conversations that I look forward to hearing about the work and the impact and the value. And I think more especially what we've, we've also tasked ourselves with this webinar is to hear about the individual experience of each one of our, of our entrepreneurs. Let me start with the foundation, everybody, um, social enterprise and social entrepreneurship. Everybody, when we started this as an organization together with Ashoka, um, it was why they an interest in social entrepreneurs. What is so special about them? And the intention of having this summit was exactly that, for us to unpack what is social entrepreneurship? What is a social entrepreneur and where do they come from? So having said that, I would love to hear from you. And I think everybody who's joining us would love to know what about social entrepreneurship you think puts together the fabric of our communities? What about it do you think builds the communities that we work in? And I think more than anything else, we'd like to find out what about your journey made you think that you'd love to take on this social passion in your life because you felt a need to have impact? Uh, may I please ask Ms. Oluashen, can I start with you? Is it fair? Probably not. But <laughs> yeah, sorry. You. Sure. Um, can you hear me well, just to be sure you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you okay. very clearly. Thank Great. you. Um, so for me, I used to think I was a social entrepreneur because my ideology of social enterprise is it has to be for profit. It has to be just about making profit and making money. But, you know, as I started my foundation in 2014, I realized that social enterprise is really about creating social impact, ensuring that the lives of people in the communities that you, you are in or that you serve, you know, is improved one way or the other. And so that's one of the things that spurred me, you know, um, into what I'm doing for the past six years, because I'm someone who is very and greatly, you know, um, unhappy with any sort of injustice, especially to women and girls who are either um, in very remote areas, who are poor and can't access certain services. And I will use my own person, um, my work as an example. So when I started, you know, researching around sexual violence, I realized that the majority of those who experienced this really did not have where to go to, to speak or how to even pay for the service in the first instance. So I decided that, you know, the way I can create change is to ensure that my own personal experience and my knowledge is brought on the table to ensure that women who experience any form of you know, gender-based violence is able to get adequate service, holistic and pro bono, which is very important because women who are in grassroots area or you know, remote areas like we mostly call it, so certainly cannot afford you know, certain things like feeding on a daily basis, um, you know, they don't have electricity and things like that. When they experience rape, the first thing that comes to their mind is, is not, let me go to a hospital and pay for this service. It's about, um, I'll just keep quiet about it and keep moving. But that's a great injust, um, injustice issue that women, you know, face. And that's why I started um, my organization. So in response to your question, I think, you know, social enterprise is really about creating social change in a very sustainable and systematic way. Thank you for that. What I love about what you just shared about your story is the fact that it emanated from exactly some of the, the challenges or the traumas that are coming from your very community. And I think a lot of people then, when we talk about social impact, we, we talk about where is it, where has it impacted me or impacted somebody in my community that I know of? And I thus felt the need, something has to be done. Thank you for that, Oluwashen. Can I please also now move on to you, Daniel Dick? I'd love to hear about your story and how you think social enterprises um, solve community challenges. Hi, Daniel. Can you hear me? Daniel? Oh, I think we might be having a challenge. Oh, there we go. There we go. Can you hear me? I am. Um um the things i agree with what yeah. Yeah. please confirm yes we can hear you daniel we can hear you we can hear you go on 
Yes, I can. You can still hear. Daniel, yeah. we, we, we might be losing you a little bit. Let, let me do this. While you're still sorting out some of your technical challenges, Daniel, relax, don't have any stress. Can I please move so, on to you, um, Zappo, so that we can... What you said um, concerning being on... Uh, Daniel, uh, I hope you can hear me. While we just wait for you to sort out your technical issues, uh, don't worry about it. I'll, let me just ask another speaker to go on, and then we can always come back to you. Can you guys hear me now? You like can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you, but just it's okay. You can sort out your technical te uh, difficulties, and we can get back to you later. It's, it's okay. Moving on to you, Nsapo, we'd love to hear about where your journey with social entrepreneurship began and what made it personal for you and what do you think about it being the fabric of building our communities? Oh, you're muted, Nsapo. The, 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 the dreaded mute. Nsapo, you're, you're muted. The, the, the dreaded mute that we live in. You're, you're muted in Sapo. <laughs> you're, you're muted in Sapo. My goodness. And in Sapo? The, I think you're, you're, mute, you're still muted. Oh my goodness. This is why. <laughs> Um, we, can, we can hear you now, Tapo. Yes. So my we journey started when I actually observed um, around me where you are. We can hear you now. Yes. So my yes, journey started out. Okay. So my journey started out when I actually observed Africa, the increasing unemployment, and then also when you when I then look, yeah, yeah, at the unemployment. So when I I saw a niche market that are the graduates, which make up around plus minus ten percent. And with everyone saying we need to find jobs, we need to find jobs. My question was then, who is going to actually create the jobs? So that's when I actually embarked on a journey to figure out how can we then use our our resources, our ways to actually develop them to be social entrepreneurs. Not only as social entrepreneurs for creating employment, but for for the team, while using innovative solutions for their better within their community. And I think also most of the companies are addressing um, issues around education, health uh, health services, and, and agriculture. During this time, and also what COVID has shown us, we really need to develop more social entrepreneurs that are going to be driving the change within their community. Thank you, Tonyana. Thank you so much, Nsapo. What I also want to come back to as we continue this conversation is I want to know why you decided to form the association. What about it around the communities that you've been engaging you felt had, you had to bring the people together? Because I think also that's what social enterprises do or what entrepreneurs try to do, to create platforms for each other in order to speak to each other. But one of the reasons we have um, the summit is we're also trying to create platforms where you speak to everybody else because there's a lot you talk to each other about but how mm. much of it is shared and exposed so that the value of the impact itself is known anyway thank you for that and can i please move to you yabe i'd love to hear about why you set up your your sustainable sustainable cities and and what you thought your value would be in terms yeah, of absolutely. your community fabric thank you uh, yes, where we came from, we came from a different angle, really. I had um, a different uh, um, startup that I was doing earlier, which was around drone data services. One of the things I noticed was actually an increasing number of my potential clients in my pipeline were actually urban related. So these were people running quarries, people looking to do uh, measurement around uh, uh, power lines they were actually asking me police were actually asking me like we're looking for i think stock theft was a was a huge issue and it still is here in botswana so they were actually asking like can you help us with surveillance and things like that for just identification and finding 
uh, where these activities are actually going on and get visualizations. So we, one of the questions that I had at the time was just really how come a lot of these challenges seem to be urban? And it was in that moment that I realized that a lot of the issues that actually happen in an urban setting, two things are, are peculiar in an African context. One, when you look at ur urban environments, they're not, they don't actually have people at the heart of them. We actually have people moving to cities, but they are not actually at the heart of how the development of the city is actually going on. So they they actually a byproduct. They people are actually a byproduct of the development of cities. They're not at the heart of it. They're not part of the, the process of developing them. And therefore, they they get to face the challenges as we actually implement projects in an ad hoc or as uh, almost in in a reactionary manner. So this really made me question whether or not there was a way to actually have an integrated holistic approach to actually how we actually uh, urbanize. This is where now I think there was a phenomenon early on. They call them smart cities. But this had a very technological focus. Technology was supposed to solve everything. And this is not really true because now it divorces people from that active participation and that focus. So it's not challenge driven. They're not focused on people, human centered design. So this is where now I think what we know now as sustainable cities, what that is actually doing is actually trying to integrate all of the different facets of the city, whether it's energy, water, housing, transportation, mobility, the infrastructure development actually see is there a way to actually integrate all of them so that we have a more holistic picture of how cities can actually develop so this is with that integrated holistic framework that is what they call uh sustainable city strategies so you're not really dealing at the project level but you're actually now looking at from a, a, a more holistic uh, uh angle or space now the what this really talks to you at the end of the day is that once you have this framework you, what you're actually doing is actually creating almost like a, a vision and an outlook for, for how projects will align to actually now make the, the space or the urban space, the platform upon which actually you can actually now transform or transition or do all of these other um, things, the impact that we're trying to make. So what essentially you're talking to there is that when you have this platform, what cities are essentially is actually about communities. So, and, and this comes back to what, what, what makes uh, social entrepreneurs so special because they actually cut across all the different sectors and they're focused on actually impacting communities that they serve and i think you saw with the other speakers they're actually very personal they're actually embedded in their communities and they're actually looking to make a difference for those communities but in partnership with those communities but w one thing that i would like to point out and i think this uh, the british council has done a study i think it was the sub-saharan african study one thing you we should be alive to and even having this conversation about social entrepreneurs and driving change is that two things one we actually don't actually have a narrative of our own, which is African, which says this is what are the drivers for social enterprise in Af in an African context, whether it's a job creation vehicle, whether it's about now um, transforming policy or anything. Like that. We don't own our own narrative. It's actually either from a donor driven or, or basically fractured uh, perspective. And I think lastly, a very interesting thing about social entrepreneurs, though we actually talk about social enterprise, in on the reality on the ground we're still talking about ngos this is more an, a donor driven project specific kind of approach social entrepreneurs ultimately they actually have a business model around how and the theories of change how they actually transform and how they engage with the community participate so it's almost a an iterative uh, business model that they're actually engaging in and this is really i think talking to a lot of the things you just touched on right now which is like the, the, the platform, they, they don't have a representative body which actually speaks for them, which actually enables them to actually be uh, more meaningfully engaged and actually visible on the ground. And I know that for a fact here in Botswana, and this is why, yeah, yeah. Can I stop you right there, Yanni, because you have now literally taken a lot of the areas that I wanted to talk to you about just as after as some of the speakers were, were, were going on. There's some things that I'd like to address. One, you talked about economy. Secondly, you talked about you talked about the economy and driving change. The second one, you talked about models, and those are some of the things that I also wanted to tease out of all of you today. So I'm happy that you've created the foundation for us, and I'm happy that now I, I my my thinking is on the right track. Let me yeah. now give please Olwani Femi, Mr. Olwani Femi Dahunsi, please welcome again. Let us get a, a slight idea of of what you think social entrepreneurs bring to to the fabric of communities. What is the change that they bring to the table? Okay, um, I grew up in a remote community where access to quality education didn't seem a concern to many people. And then 
I found out that those guys who didn't have access to quality education literally went into drugs and then started becoming loud and then hoodlums in the communities. That, that was happening because there wasn't a sustainable and flexible structure relating to education in the community. And then kind of like a face-to-face -face approach where young people who don't have access to quality education can get at least uh, access to education or digital skills. So social enterprises or social enterprise in Africa or in different communities are very special. Why? Because the world wouldn't change without social change agents or um, kind of change makers like everyone here. We have to play our own part. So social enterprise kind of put in that direct, sustainable and self implementable way to change their world. Using my, myself as an example, I saw that young people in my community had no access to quality education. And then I, I asked myself, if in the next five years this keeps happening, that's a pool of the next generation of young leaders. That means they wouldn't be Bill Gates in our own time. They wouldn't be, be Mark Zuckerberg in our own generation, which is very bad. So I needed the fastest and sustainable way to eradicate this. So that is where the social enterprise came in. So it's a direct approach, which now helps young people and trains them on how and how, gives them access to quality education. But not just that, it gives them kind of like a balanced approach on not just learning a skill, but now utilizing their skill to change the world. So in that kind of summary, social enterprises are not just changing the world, they are actually changing and social enterprises have a particular implementable structure that doesn't just change the world, it actually improves the economy globally, not just in that community. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And I think you, you're also touching on the, that component of the impact on the economy. I like that because I'm definitely coming to that. There's a, there's a misconception around what social enterprises actually bring to the economy. And I'd like to find out from your experiences, what has is, what is that misconception been? But uh, before we do that, Daniel Dick, has your connection improved? We'd love to hear from you as well around the, the, the social enterprises and their impact and in, in, in creating the social fabric in communities. Hi, Daniel. Can you can you hear me? Sorry, I don't. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yes. Can, yes. can you guys now. still hear me? Please confirm you can. Yes. Fantastic. We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Um, I have been having a terrible time with my internet connection. Um, so talking about social entrepreneurship and social enterprise, I think. Um, I will agree with what Oluwaseun said about being unhappy about the things happening in our community. And when I started as a change maker growing up in the slum community, I got to find out that there is a lot of um, um, inequality faced by these children from slum communities. Most of the crimes linked in, um, in our both urban and regional plants, they are all directed towards children from slum communities. And I saw a lot of stuff and I feel like there has to be something. And just like um, Oluwa Nifemi said, people have to step into uh, positions of leadership. People have to start thinking beyond just, okay, um, it is this is my life, but we have to, we are here to serve. And I think Yemi made that very clear. We're here to serve. And if there's one average I feel like um, the social enterprise is bringing in is the, uh, the, the approach of serving. And one thing that is beautiful about social entrepreneurship is that we aren't leading leaders just to be, um, we aren't just changing our community. We are also changing our community and also raising other leaders from these communities to do the same thing we're doing. And I think this is the main, the main approach of serving. You don't just serve without raising successors. And I think that's one thing social enterprises are doing. And one of the few things I think I would want to point out in terms of my social entrepre um, entrepreneur journey is that the fact we live in a world where people depend solely on the government. And this is one, um, one um, approach we need to deal with. People feel that the government needs to always do something. And I feel like it's time young people actually stand in that gap. Young people have to start saying that this is our problem. And in order to solve this, we have to be in the decision process. We have to start taking actions in our little efforts. And when I started my journey, I said to myself that we can't just all depend on the government. 
nothing. We can all just wait for it to come. We have to start doing something. We have to start teaching these people that people from slum communities have a life and they deserve to dream. They deserve uh, to live best life out there. And in order to do this, we have to sensitize and letting people know, okay, um, this is not the right part. We, we started educating them, letting them know that they also can be leaders in their community. And I think it's really important. That's what the social enterprise is all about. Raising leaders, you know, in one sentence, it is all about reaching out to people, solving their problem, and also raising them as leaders to also reach out to other people. So it's like the social enterprise space is actually building more leaders. It's like the normal Ashoka um, slogan that says change makers actually reaching out to more change makers. So I feel like the social entrepreneur is actually bringing up young leaders and we are really doing it in an effective way because we are seeing the change and yes, we can. Super, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Daniel. You know what I, what I appreciate about what you just said is the fact that social entrepreneurs have seen themselves as it starts with me, then it becomes a we movement and then it becomes an us movement. But that very thinking is one of the areas that has left a lot of people not understanding the value of social entrepreneurs and what their real um, impact or value to change is. And that's some of the things that we spoke to earlier on when, when Yami mentioned economy and making an impact and bringing on. I would like to go back to that to say they have been viewed as, as non-profit organizations and as NGOs and as helping all about change and impact and doing good. But the, the view of them also being economic drivers has been very shaky, has also has, has left them sometimes feeling like, well, I suppose all I can do if I'm in uh, I'm and I understand the, the traumas that I've seen some of the young girls and women in my community go through, I suppose all I can do is just give them a hug and be there for them and set up a nonprofit that helps them with, with, with addressing some of those issues. But I cannot see how I can now take that and make it something that can even create a bigger impact, which is the economic drivers. What do you think about that? How do you see social enterprises or even yourselves as social entrepreneurs being part of the economic social social drive and making sure that they also create livelihoods and create impact? Can I can I have anybody? You're more than okay, welcome. So, uh, oh. You're more than welcome, Oluwashin. I was just about to call your name to express your views on that. Okay, sorry. Um, so I do, I do understand and I agree with Yami uh, regarding, you know, um, social enterprise, driving economic change and development. Um, but I also need to, to state clearly that I do not think social enterprise is likened to NGO. It's actually seen more as, you know, business models. Like I said, when I started my presentation, I didn't see myself as a social enterprise entrepreneur because my work is uh, majorly not for profits um, and social enterprise is seen from the light of you know business model but in the work that I do that is not for profit I'm also creating economic change because for instance women who are abused in certain communities and reach out to us and do not have economic means of you know survival we provide them with training and resources to start businesses that can help them sustain themselves and their families as well as contribute to society. So even though it's coming from a not-for-profit setting, it also has a, um, an economic impact that it does. And for us as a not-for-profit, for instance, we also have a side of us that um, you know, tries to generate income and create a better society. Let me give you an instance. The issue of sexual harassment in the workplace is widely known. It's not just related to Nigeria alone. Majority of the country's experiences. So what we have done is to create a, a business model where we can train companies on sexual harassment, help them develop sexual harassment policies that create a better system for women and men to work, to work in. And then in return, we get resources to our organization. This resources is then used to empower more women in the communities where these companies are situated. So it's a not-for-profit um, structure, but the model also has you know, economic impact inside. So I do agree with the statement that it's not just about impact, but majorly, if you look at every service or product that is being created, either for business or for whatever, it must have the social fabric of impact. And when you remove impact from a social enterprise, you basically have a business. 
Um, and I'm not saying businesses are wrong, they are great. But what's most important is that when you develop a product or service, that it's improving the lives of those around you, those in your community, and the nation in general. So that would be my response. Thank you for that. You also mentioned the, the modeling component. I, I, I love that because the fact that uh, the social enterprise is, is a model in itself, but if we were to unpack it further, what else exists within it? But we'll, we'll get back to that. I just want to have a quick look at some of the, the, the comments that we're getting. Please, everybody, I urge you, whatever you're hearing that our panelists are talking about um, that is of interest, whether you agree or whether you have a differing opinion or whether you also have an opinion that has that you have that has happened to you at, at a different instance. You're free to comment, you're free to ask questions. Please engage us, engage the speakers. That's why we're here today. Having said that, can I please then ask you, please, uh, if you can give us a, a sort of your opinion on, on what I've just mentioned as, as a social enterprise and it's being an economic driver and the fact that the misconception has always been very primarily so that it is meant to be only social and therefore it's parked in a corner at some point. But now we want to see what can it do? How can it drive change also through economic drivers? Um, and I think for me, commercial entrepreneurs are focusing on some of the social and economic issues that are facing the country. I agree with you. It starts with your own personal experience. But what I've found is that a lot of social enterprises, they tend to absorb the skilled um, people that do not have the, 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 the skills to actually enter into the formal economy economy. So they create that space of them actually um, engaging in their social enterprises in jobs um, for, those, for those people. And I think we saw on the British, as Yama mentioned, the, the report that was recently published by the British Council. Social enterprises, they tend to create more jobs in your traditional businesses. So I think from, for me, it then became important for me to actually found the organization to say, you want to actually develop more social entrepreneurs as a movement, because the more people you have that are solving these issues, then the better. And also the about them is that you are not only focusing on the profit, but you are also focusing on improving the lives of the people where you are actually um, operating. And I think for me, I think that the businesses cannot drive in environments that are not empowered. So it then becomes the role of the businesses you know, to sort of look after the people that they are catering for. And also when we are looking at the impact of COVID, I think more businesses that are established during this phase, they need to actually center their solutions around the people that they are catering for and be solution. So I think that's how we change because social entrepreneurs are focusing on the people instead of um, looking at how much profit am I gonna make? Thank you. Thank you for that, Zapo. Thank you so much for that. Um, I I think for your, what interests me between you and, and Yami the most is that you, and I, it does not take away from the fantastic work that's been done by all of our speakers, is that you, you, you went one step to create platforms. And I want to talk to that later on because just that, just that creation of something bigger and something that is a collective, is something that I think is, is also inherent in what we, we term as the traditional enterprise um, system and how they take themselves. But social entrepreneurs have never been, have never wanted to maybe co create those collectives because it's about what are we really saying? We, we're talking to each other. We need to now start talking outside there. But I'm going to unpack that a little bit with you later on. Can I please speak to uh, uh, Yami, please? And I'd love to hear some of your, your, your insights on that as well. Um, I think my main insight, uh, specifically on this topic, uh, when you're looking at it from an African perspective, and I would say even here from a Botswana perspective, the issue, like you say, where, how do you know how much impact is being made? Uh, you can actually show the contribution and you can actually now see what's working 
uh, you can't really i don't want to call it best practice but see what what difference is being made who is being made by and how those interventions now can start to inform other actions whether that may be policy changes that may be more developing programs that can actually now start to crowd in just like in some ways it's been mentioned crowd in other in, uh, players so that they act, it almost creates a value change so other people can start to see where they fit in because somebody's taking that step to create the opportunity the real issue at heart from from how i see it is that there is no real gathering there's no concerted effort to gather evidence so i won't call it measurement but gathering evidence just to show exactly what is going on who's doing what so we do we you'd call it uh, mapping just to know who's making a difference in what capacity in what industry sector and also more importantly who's actually the stakeholder who's actually providing support so there's another mapping exercise that has to be done on the other side which is from from the other government or industry or or other uh larger donor led or donor initiatives where people want to come in and actually help through programmatic efforts they also have to be mapped to see along the growth and i'll actually say along the growth path of of a social enterprise where what where do they where where do they play and what kind of role they're actually playing so a mapping exercise both on the side is required evidence gathering to actually show who the interventions so that's measuring the impact itself this could be either in the health sector transportation mobility it could be access to energy because we're talking about poverty in some sense whether it's housing poverty energy poverty uh, access to public services or other social services that are required to, in the community so that evidence needs to be gathered but more more importantly what you find is that uh, there is no representative body i don't like to talk to asking people to actually now engage in policy because obviously you know government is the main driver of all this but when you're trying to influence poverty uh, policy rather you, you, you if you are trying to now shift your business model to actually now we're focusing on policy and training and capacitation you're shifting what you actually what you should be actually focusing on and it takes away dilutes the impact that you can actually make you, when you continue on your path others should come close and actually help you actually gathering your evidence and actually showing your impact and actually then show what what could be of influence from a growth uh, or actually policy change perspective so i think a representative body element what i like to call an intermediary body um just to give an example in, in terms of the uk for example even now i think more in canada and australia and i think south africa has gone down this path a social enterprise alliance this is a representative body that looks from a thematic perspective on how to actually now be a partner to government and now this is the an entity that represents social entrepreneurs by which uh let's say for example a change of chamber of commerce can actually recognize as its partner but representative of the the, the social entrepreneurs themselves what their concerns are where what change that they they what differences that they they would like to see being made in terms of the support that's being brought to them and actually then that intermediary body is actually the custodian of any other programmatic or financial support that that anybody would like to bring to bear to actually now support these social entrepreneurs because we know there you you as a social entrepreneur there's uh, as covid has shown you are the, the 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 realities on the on the ground in terms of resources technical skills capacitation uh, in terms of even finances to sustain your, your the impact you're making it's actually quite quite uh, large and we haven't even touched on your growth journey yet how you'd like to scale your impact but that is actually important that the, that that intermediary is actually created and uh, and this is where I, I i think one thing that i liked about the british council report is actually you find that governments yet still don't even have a social enterprise uh so like strategy or policy so a social enterprise strategy and also a social investment strategy which is two different things on the one hand it's how do they recognize and how do they actually support social entrepreneurs so they like just like we have for profit resident we have companies and intellectual property authorities which are register of companies there should be an, a recognized mark for social entrepreneurs to actually say i can go to this entity and register as a social entrepreneur so that i'm recognized as a social entrepreneur in country so that anybody anywhere knows that i'm a social entrepreneur and then secondly government also is actually for social investment strategy how are they going to sustainably a support social entrepreneurs through investment what kind of capacitation programs initiatives are. so these two are quite critical as well so i think for me that that really is where 
I wouldn't say the challenge, but where the opportunity for for this transformation to actually now uh, support social entrepreneurs is actually required. And this can be at a, any African, you can pick any African country. If you go down this path, it, it will actually amplify the impact that social entrepreneurs can make. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Yami. Yeah, I I absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. And I, I'm just also looking at some of the the comments that I'm seeing here. Uh, uh, there's a there's one that's that's come up and said, please can some of the you as social entrepreneurs or the speakers today please share with us some of the challenges that they've gone through to get to where they are. And I want to add on just a little. I want to. Add, I know there are many. There are many of them, and I can just imagine we don't have enough time. But um, if you can pick a few, but just before I say that, what I would like you to also then speak to is that for you to get to where you are, we're talking about pre-COVID challenges. And then COVID, the pandemic happened. And now we are, we're being termed as not post-COVID because the actual virus is gone, but post-COVID because there's a, there's a transition into how resilient and, and how we're going to now survive what has happened to us. So I'd like you to not only talk about some of the challenges that you've gone through as social um, enterprises, but also maybe what was your pre-COVID, your during COVID, and now your post-COVID sort of outlook and, 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 and maybe challenges or maybe even goodness about it. I don't know, whichever one. Maybe Anybody I can take that. I can take that because I was just coming off of this last verse. I will just take it very quickly. Uh, I'll say pre-COVID, with my issue specifically of sustainable cities, you'll find that it's not well understood. You you find by and large what you're trying to do is not well understood. You, most importantly, you find that you're probably doing what you're doing alone. So when I say alone, you're, you're not going to stay alone forever, but you have to start alone simply because the message has to be clear. And then people can actually see very vividly what you're trying to achieve. So then they can see what role they can play in actually support or bringing other support to bear. Um, you find that even with my, get, my issue is specifically with sustainable city. It's, a, it's specifically a policy decision of government. So government has to decide that it wants to develop sustainable city. So finding the right government department to actually engage because obviously they have to make a decision and then commit government to this to this uh, direction then the issue of uh, even understanding they think they're doing a good job but they don't even know they're they're being left behind by the the the, the global context so this is pre-covid now i think what COVID has done specifically it's actually funny enough it's a blessing in disguise and i will I know that some people will say yeah we've lost a lot of people but it actually is a blessing in disguise in that it, it exposed so many of the inequalities or the challenges, the, 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 what we thought we understood, because it, it took us all, to, it is a leveler. It leveled everything and we experienced it all globally at the same time, which is very unique from any, uh, anything I've ever seen in my lifetime. But we experienced it all at the same time globally. So we're actually asking ourselves the same question. If this is the rot that we saw, the, I like to think of it as the swamp is being drained. You see all the, the dead bodies and all the, 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 the rot that has been. And what this has brought to bear is that people are actually asking the question, how can things be done? Not better or fix the problems of before, but how can we move forward? Uh, not build back better, but build forward better. And this obviously requires everybody because obviously we're, we're facing all these challenges together. So the reality at the end of the day, in, in, from my perspective, moving forward, I'm actually now dealing with government directly at a very senior level. They, they know they have a decision to make. It brought the agenda forward because they hear other people elsewhere talking about the exact same things I've been going on for the last four years, where uh, just to get to the room, it's taken me four and a half years just to get to the room and facing the person who has to make a decision based on what I'm trying to achieve. And that kind of patience, uh, by and large, from an African context, it's very challenging because you're only supported generally by your either family or somebody who's very, very um, supportive in this regard. In my context, it's my family, but also from a technical perspective, it's somebody who's actually in the UK. We, we've never met, but we, he's my mentor and technical partner. He's in the UK. He does this for a living. He's very well connected in the UK and also in Europe. But he could see the vision that I had for what I'm trying to achieve. And he actually said, no, I will lend you my expertise, my experience, my understanding, so that when you communicate, you know the stages of where you are on this journey. So it's almost like I was in a readiness program building up to the stage. Yeah, so it's a very hard... There's a, there's a, 
there, there's a lot more that I, you know, I don't know, Yami. I, I, maybe I think we should stop, bro. I think I should be the boss. Right? <laughs> you should be and I should sit there because we yeah, seem to be on the same track, honestly. Yeah, it's a huge challenge. And the thing is, we're here now where we... we we, we, the challenges we're facing, COVID forced a pivot you, and even how you understand what you're trying to achieve. So I don't know, I want to cut it there, but really the issue is that now it forced governments to actually listen to those coming with solutions and you're being heard a lot more. But you, how you do things actually now, the tactics you employ has, has had to change as a result of COVID itself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, there's, there's a lot said there. And I think even some of the other speakers, anybody want to come in? Ulwani Femi, do you want to come in? Daniel Dick, I saw you smiling, thumbs up. Do you want to come in there and, and sort of share a little bit more around that? Because, I mean, the journey itself is what you came Yeah, it's been a lot listening to Yemi. It's been a lot listening to Yemi. Um, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. Like, listening to him and talking about the um, COVID-19, I, I really can relate in terms of building our project as um, an organization. I know, I mean, I, I feel like the African continent haven't really done so well in terms of supporting social enterprise. And this is something that we really need to look at, like, because there aren't sufficient resources. Meanwhile, the social enterprise is here to serve. And I feel the government of Africa really need to, to take this into consideration that we are not a competition, but we are here to help. We're here to support their work and also make things happen for them. So pre-COVID, I feel like one of the main um, challenges we face as a foundation is um, lack of access to resources. And when we talk about resources, we're not talking about finances. We're talking about access to some, um, some communities, access to some schools, access to some kids, because we feel like if we had all access, we would be able to like help these people. So I feel like the African continent haven't really, I'm so sorry to say, but I feel like we haven't really supported the social enterprise sector. And this is something that we have to do. And during the COVID-19, I mean, just like Yemi said, the COVID-19 has or with me being a blessing in disguise. I felt like the COVID-19 came and sort of like gave us this push and this urge to grow. Because at first I felt like we were doing a lot. I think we were doing a lot. But then when the COVID-19 came, it was like a channel, a whole different arena to, to just explode into a world. We had no choice than to so virtual and while we went virtual i got to find out that the social enterprise haven't really done so well in terms of integrating technology into how they effect change and that was when it dawned on me that we need to do so much in terms of teaching young people the importance of technology because i feel in africa this is some this is the future right this is the future technology is the future and if social enterprise don't use so well about the, the, the advantage of technology we're going to to be lagging behind as a continent and that is what the COVID-19 came to show us this is one thing that it really showed us that the importance of technology in terms of causing change in our community cannot be overemphasized and this is something that I feel we are now doing people are now being forced to go virtual summits are now being forced to go virtual we have meetings that are now virtual schools are now virtual right it's not becoming like technology is a new big thing and this is really good for us because I feel like we we are being forced to grow and this is like a, a new channel to to communicate and effect change and if we had like if we were ready before COVID-19 I mean we wouldn't be so well affected so I feel like this COVID-19 has really really helped us and moving on believe me when they moving on the well, they said there's a new normal, and this is something that we're all trying to adapt to. But I feel like the social enterprise needs to start integrating technology in terms of how we effect change. Because we are moving into a era of social um, where change is actually in effect in terms of um, um, using the help of technology. So I personally would agree with all what Yemi said. Um, the the COVID-19 came as a shock. It came as a surprise. But then when you look deep down, it actually gave us this opportunity to grow and um, to get ready for whatever would come. I don't know, but for whatever would come, it's sort of like the social enterprise is getting to realize that we can do more beyond just meeting physically. We can do more as a, as a community 
virtually the same way we've been doing physically. So I think the COVID-19 really did expand our knowledge and forced us to grow. And yes, in terms of support, the social enterprise are doing a lot, but I feel like there are a lot of limiting factors that are stopping us. And one of them is oh. lack of resources. And yeah. this is something we need to always look out for. No, we're, we're definitely getting to that. We're definitely getting to that, Daniel, uh, because that's an area I think we all have to look at what is lacking, what extra, what more needs to be done in order to support social enterprises to be able to, to self-actualize. But can I hear a little bit more from Olua Femi, please, or Rashen, your thoughts around some of the, the challenges um, pre-COVID pre um, and, and what you think COVID has, has now done and for you are the challenge within it and now the opportunities as we get out. I mean, from even from your own perspective I mean, or from some of the, the the sector that you're you're also working in thank you Oluwa for me okay so i'm going to be agreeing with um daniel he's been saying a lot about pre-covid and post-covid so the pre-covid the one of the challenges that young people and social enterprises have been having a uh, lack of resources really because not just resources and financial resources like kind of lack of resources where they don't have people to train or where they cannot have access to kind of people to train, really. So um, kind of putting that into a framework, we need to do more in supporting social enterprises. We need to actually do more in designing sustainable structures that help social enterprises thrive. For example, I'm going to use my organization, Tism Empowerment, as an example. During the COVID, it didn't affect us very much because we had kind of like a flexible structure that was able to adapt to the COVID-19 pandemic immediately. So the, 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 as soon as the COVID-19 pandemic struck, what we did was move virtually immediately. And then we started training young people on how to, on young people to get access to skills and then to utilize the skills. Now running into post-COVID, I think that it's a blessing in disguise, like Yami said, is helping young people thrive, helping young people understand what they really need to do. Because the world cannot change unless there are social agents there to create the change we need. So the post-COVID, is really helping young people, or the COVID really itself is, has helped many young people discover what they need to do. For example, my organization trained over 900 people during COVID-19 online. We wouldn't have achieved that kind of number if it was physically. I mean, we, we extended to over 14 countries where we were able to equip young people and the horses they need to try. And then we were able to get that because the schools that were training young people had no option than to come back to us. Because we had the resources, we had the kind of online virtual framework to train their students. So they had no option. They had to come back to us and give them, give us the resources we need to train their own students. So um, the COVID has been really a blessing in disguise. And then I feel that if every social enterprise can have a flexible structure in which they do not depend on resources alone, but they kind of create their own resources to equip them and equip the organization to thrive, they would be able to cover like 98% of the issues that many social enterprises have. For example, my organization is self-funded by me, and then I didn't just get that money from my parents or different grants. In fact, we've never received grants. So what we did was firstly design a social enterprise structure, kind of like a structure that helps, that brings people from all, from the, 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 the social enterprise, like the non-profit part of the social enterprise to the profit aspects, and then gains that profit and send back to social enterprise. So we just need to kind of design self sustainable structures that can change Africa and change the world at large. It's that easy. Thank you. Thank and you. And just to, oh, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. No, Edward, please. I was just about to say, if anybody yeah, wants I just to want to say comments. something very brief. So Nigeria, yes, for instance, has um, the ease of doing business policy. But I think the major problem is an enabling environment for social enterprises to thrive. You know, you say you want businesses to thrive or you want entre entrepreneurs to thrive, but you have, you know, different taxes, you have different um, foreign po um, policies that do not favor, you know, those who are running businesses. Just use my own organization fund as an example. Pre-COVID, one of the major challenges I, you know, I had was really changing systemic um, um, perceptions around violence against women and girls. And so what I did was to make up my mind 
to understand that this work requires consistency for change. And that's something, you know, um, Yami rightly mentioned, patience. I wasn't, you know, trying to um, do an organization that would change the world in two seconds. I know it would take time to improve knowledge, change attitudes and practices. So I stayed consistently on my course. And that's what sometimes, you know, um, I mean, recognizing the fact that it can be frustrating, but it's important that, you know, entrepreneurs are very patient um, with with their, their, their work, having a clear strategy plan for the good and the bad, you know, so that you're able to manage it properly. Um, and so what I did was to consistently do my work Hi, always Shane. I think we, we we lost you a little bit there, but don't worry. We'll allow you to finish that that statement afterwards. I also just want to take this opportunity just to to recognize some of the comments that we're getting in. I saw one from Vanessa, and Vanessa was saying it's a good thing that now social. Ent I'm just paraphrasing here, Vanessa, that she's happy that now social enterprises or so social entrepreneurs are now being recognized for the work that they're doing, and that it's about time. And there's also something that I saw from Chikodi as well, who said he he loves the fact that it's now a pan it, it's a pan african conversation and that he he thinks that going going in into the future he'd like to see it as governments not come sort of benchmarking with what the best is out there. And I think it's also taking it from what you mentioned, Yami, saying you also have mentors and people that you're engaging with also in the UK and where there's certain best practices that are happening. They may be ahead, but it, by bringing it back and you're trying to incorporate it into the work that you're doing is also sort of helping you to grow in yourself. So I think Chikori also recognizes that as well. I see another one, um, comment from Lamido saying that um, he's, it's, he's, he's see, he loves the fact that, oh no, no, he says that he, he wants to understand that the that some of the movements that social enterprises are, are in or some of the work that they're doing uh, may be Eminence, am I saying that has little or no impact or unpronounced in the end? I, I think I need to understand that better uh, so that I can ex explain that to my to my panelists. I'll get back to that. Don't worry. But I think he said my understanding of it is that he thinks that it is it's being done in in not a vacuum. So this is me paraphrasing on his behalf that maybe it's being done in a vacuum and that the impact is not going as wide. But part of the conversation then today on how it is that social change is being driven, we're actually recognizing that it's the it's it's the opposite. It is being driven wide. It did begin in a vacuum at some point. But part of what the pandemic has also brought forth forth with it, which is what you've shared with us, is that it it it's catapulted the value of social enterprise and the work that's being done to to the top. Yami, Yami made a, an analogy of the swamp being drained. Exactly that. It was always there, but now social enterprises became an, a, a key to, to solving some of those to some of those issues. Um, I see somebody else uh, saying that um, she's proud also of being a young Nigerian and seeing um, some of the work that is being done and seeing that the, there's a lot of the uh, uh, that the, the youth is limitless in Nigeria. I'm happy about that. Thank you so much. I'm happy to see that. Um, and also there's another one that I would like to speak to that I saw that I thought was was a fantastic, but I'll get back to that while I allow our other panelists to, to answer. I thought it was quite great. If I can just check my notes, I'll see. I'll get back to everybody. But there's a comment there that I'll get back to that I thought was quite important. Um, but if I get back to you, panelists, We've, we've talked about how social enterprises are seen to be um, driving social change. So the question has been put out there, yes or no? I, I think we're in total agreement, yes. And we've also shown some of the ways that they, they've brought about this change. And I think most importantly, we've even showed that there's sustainability and there's adaptability and that there's actually um, disruption did not destroy destroy the, the pandemic being the disruptor did not destroy the potential that social enterprises can show. What I would now like to talk to you about is that um, innovation. And I think, was it, was it only one family who spoke to you, was it Daniel Dake? Innovation. How has, the, has COVID now forced a lot of social enterprises to be innovative? You talked about now it, technology coming to the forefront. We talked about how um, some of the challenges that we used to have, we saw solutions in them. I, could you maybe share in, in your experiences and some of the uh, 
your your activities and your engagements yeah. how how you've been innovative or how innovation you've been forced to be to bring about innovation in your areas and also how some of the challenges that you you've come through um some of the practices that you you know what can i how can i put this some of when you overcame is that are those practices that you can share with many people Am I, am I making sense, panelists? I, I know that was a mouthful, but I'm just trying to pick a little bit from some of the areas that you've all mentioned. Please feel free, anybody who would like to respond. respond. Daniel, do you Can I say you? something? Daniel, do you think so? Please go on, Daniel. Please go on, Daniel. Yes, yes, go, go okay. ahead. Okay, okay. Um, I would, I would have loved to have the firm to go first. Okay, so in terms of um, innovation, when we're talking about social enterprise and the new innovation in Africa, I think one of the things we have to understand is the social enterprise is now introducing the African youth or um, the younger generation to the advantages of um, digital skills to um, technology. I mean, one of the things we're doing at the Things for Change Foundation is we're empowering people through ICT related skills and getting ready for the future of work. So, and I think this is one of the innovative approach that um, the social enterprise is using. And one of which is really important is the feedback. Because I feel like social enterprise come in, not like people who are distant from their, um, their stakeholders, but as people who have been part of this problem, who understand this problem, who are now looking for ways they could, um, they could bring innovative ideas into solving the problem. So one of the few things I think Think we're doing right as social entrepreneurs is true um, um, innovating and expanding the, um, the the younger generation to the advantages we have in the technological world. I can personally use my organization because we teach skills. So, and one of the things we've been doing is we're collective as to which skills we are teaching these people. We have to understand that we need to teach things that are necessary to the problems we're trying to solve. So, to every community, we have different problems, and to every um, every gathering, we have different solutions. So one of the things we're understanding is we don't want to decide problem. We don't want to decide solutions to these people, and that goes down to the question that I think someone asked about um, um, the social enterprise not solving the right problem. And I think it's something that's really applicable because I feel if as a social entrepreneur, before you go out. If we're talking about being innovative, before you go out, you have to understand what the problem is. You have to talk to your stakeholders. You have to talk to people that are affected by this problem. And I think that's what we're doing. It's brilliant to see how social entrepreneurs are going into the slum streets, into the problem, and getting to know the actual problem. Because we don't want a society where we are deciding what we feel it's the problem while we're not really tackling the real problem. So that is one of the innovative ways I think social entrepreneurs are really doing a lot. They are coming as people who have been part of this problem. I mean, a lot of us on this panel, for every project we are running right now, we sort of have like a background connecting us. I grew up from the slum. I know what it is to, to not have meals. I know what it is to, to walk on the streets. So these are things that have been part of me. So to, in order to bring innovative solutions I know where the shoe is painting and I know what exactly we need to do. And that is really being innovative. That is really being part of the problem and knowing what to do instead of just being very far from the problem and thinking, you know, most times we feel like we, we, we know what the problem is. But until we get to interact with these people, that's when we know what the actual problem is. So I feel the social enterprise is really doing in terms when it comes to innovation. Innovation. Now we're not in the old system. This old system that has been passed from decades about um you, you you just assume things. You just assume that if a community isn't doing well, it's because they don't have access to water. No, most times we have to ask questions. We have to go into the streets. We we need to meet people living there. We need to find out what is the actual problem. And this is one thing that I know social entrepreneurs are doing. Oh, that is beautiful. Thank you, Daniel. And, Thank you so um, much for that. Uh, the, the passion that you bring forth is amazing. Zappo, can I have a, your view as well? Oh, yes, go ahead, Zappo. I was about to say, please. Oh, yes. um, I'd love to hear your um, thoughts. Um, thank you so much for the, thank you so much for the opportunity. I think when we are 
talking about innovation, as Daniel has mentioned, that part of social entrepreneurs, the research component then becomes very important because you might think that the solution that you are bringing to the people is what the, 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 the people need, but it's actually the other way around. So what I've found and what my experience has been, it has taken me a lot of research to actually come up with a solution that actually the people feel this is the, 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 the solution that we need. So part of it means you then need to go back and actually, so you, you constantly keep going back and forth, trying to do the research in order for you to provide the right services. But what I can say in, in terms of technology, I think technology has provided us with a platform to actually reach further than where we would if we did not have COVID. So I think also I share the same sentiment as much as COVID came with so many challenges. But for social entrepreneurs, we are seeing a lot of opportunities, how we can actually improve the lives of the people that we are operating with in communities. So definitely innovation then becomes part of that. But I think also as social entrepreneurs, it's then very important for us to do our research so that when we go to stakeholders, we go knowing that this is backed up. This is actually the solution that people are willing to actually pay for. And also this is what you believe in. And I think during these times of COVID, what has kept us going is the commitment to the mission. So you are committed to wanting the impact or to, to impact your community positively. So you tend to go on, even though it feels like you would rather you know, lose sight of the big vision. So I think, I think innovation then becomes very important. But also those innovative solutions then have to really address what it is that the communities are needing. And COVID has really shown us, especially the gaps exist in education and in the healthcare centers. There's a huge opportunity right there for, for, for innovation and new solutions. Thanks, Nyana. Thank you, Nzapo. And you know what? I, I, I love you. You are literally the very... Oh, yes, okay. Go ahead, old one. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up a little bit. I'll just say what I wanted to say with you. Go, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Okay, so um, I, want, I want to say something about what Daniel said. And Daniel really was really on, on point, actually. You know why? Because... The government cannot keep making decisions for us and claim to be with us, but do it without us. So what, what social enterprises are doing is we're targeting the problem from the root, so the problem cannot break in. We're killing the root of that problem by kind of understanding what the problem is. How did this problem form? How did this problem evolve? So we're, we're working with people in those communities via synergy. And they were not just um, saying, oh, they need electricity they need water we're, we're going to see the root of the problem so if they if they need electricity that means and if they have water there that means they can get electricity by um a hydro by a hydro or if they have too much sun they can get electricity by um solar so what we're trying to do or what social enter enterprises are doing is they're targeting problems from the root and then, then they're not just creating solutions they're creating lifelong solutions so if you look at the the, the scale or the structure of uh, organizations like Yami's organization, like Daniel's organization, they are kind of, they didn't just design the organization to solve a problem. They designed the organization to solve a sustainable problem, systematic problems, problems that have been happening, have been happening, that you're trying to solve it wisely and then so that the problem cannot break again. Because one of the things that would be a failure for us is if in the next 10 years our children have a problem we're solving. It will be a bad thing. So what social enterprises are doing is we're solving the root from a problem and telling the government that you can't make decisions for us and then without us. That that is thank you for that, Olua yeah, family. Thank you so much for that. And, and if I just go back to what you said in Sapo when you talked about you you were you were in the ground, almost in the ditches during COVID and and part of, I mean it's because it's nothing new to a lot of social enterprises. This is nothing new to you. And I think that's part of why we also wanted this summit to focus on sustainability and resilience, because that resilience is actually core to the, it speaks to the core of what many social entrepreneurs reflect themselves or see themselves as. There's a comment also there where one of the, the, the attendees mentioned that um, how do you, let me quickly just go to it now. Uh, he said, I, I do apologize. There's so many coming in. I'm so happy. Thank you very much to the attendees for sharing some of the information um, and sharing some of the thoughts. This one was actually quite interesting. He said that he was talking about, can those, she was Sarah, Sarah, thank you so much for that. Can those starting something new in their community be given any form of guidance and support to do so? 
And I suppose what, Sarah, I'd like to just paraphrase what you'd like to say is, what is the some of the support that you think is, is required going forward? And I think it takes me to some of the, another area that I want to speak to. Yami and some of you have mentioned it earlier, policy reform. Okay, I know, Yami, you said there's policy reform and then there's also the economic sort of uh, reform side of things. But I mean, if you if somebody's asking you if they're, they're Sarah and she wants to start doing something new in the community, but first, how can she be given guidance and support to do so? So where does she begin? Other than talking to her next door neighbor or another entrepreneur, if we even take it to another level, what does... What do we need? What sort of policy reform do we need in order to have, create enabling environments for people like Sarah to be able to to begin without having to look and maybe bump into a Daniel um, one day? Um, maybe if I can take that. Um, th that question is very interesting. It's very interesting in it's hello. Yeah, it's very interesting in the regard that what she's actually talking to is actually the support that's actually not been given. Because you, you find that governments, because there, there, there needs to be that specific policy saying that we're going to recognize social enterprise, we're going to make sure we support them in this manner, provide this thing. That policy and that thing has to go through parliaments. It, take, it could take upwards of to do a study first and then you get a, a government to, to make it, to take a position and then take it to parliament through a policy paper. That process takes a very long time. But what it actually is actually rooted in is actually evidence. And it, so it, rather than waiting for the policy to come forward, what is actually missing right now to actually answer Sarah's question is actually that showcasing of that evidence of what is working where and what kind of model. I think uh, Ulufemi has touched on this. What kind of model has been created to sustain that, that difference that's actually being made? So um, I know a very good uh, entity that too, actually, that, that actually... Play a, spa play a role in this regard, but which we don't have a lot of examples of from, uh, from an African perspective. The Social Enterprise uh, UK is actually a body that actually represents social entrepreneurs in the UK. So that model is there of an intermediary organization that recognizes social entrepreneurs and creates programs to actually support the change that they actually want to make. Then there's also a Social Enterprise Academy. The Social Enterprise Academy has distilled the knowledge or the ongoing knowledge around how social entrepreneurs are actually making a difference in communities wherever globally. And they actually have created almost uh, learning material and programs which actually now can actually show you where you begin and how you can actually grow. Just like we, we often do with for-profit entities, but now it's for mission-driven entities. I know Acumen is a, is a very, it's another program that actually focuses on the learning and development aspect to actually now say, how do you create almost your human-centered design, your, your theory of change? So these concepts, if you're there, you're Sarah, and you don't know that these are the things you have to work on, how do you begin? So now the, the real issue is that for people like Sarah who are in, now are stuck, well, how do I begin this journey? I think um, uh, it's really in the absence of a policy or any kind of framework where you are in your community, the real issue comes in in actually asking your question, the, the single question that we've all asked ourselves, which is, oh, who are you? I mean, you, you really have to understand yourself first, uh, but it, it's not in actually trying to make a difference in what you understand. It's actually looking at the broader problem or, or a, a, a bigger problem than yourself. And if that problem is not big enough, if it's not if it's not shaking you and it's making making you feel like this is the one, then you know that's the wrong problem. So you must it must scare you. If I'll never be able to achieve this. When you have that one problem that you actually have identified and it scares you because of the sheer scale of the problem, then you know that's the problem that's calling you. Now the issue becomes because you understand yourself, is actually now how am I being pulled towards now walking the journey? Because you won't, you won't achieve that journey, that uh, solving of that problem alone. You actually, what you're trying to do is actually, they call it the universe. The universe will call solutions or people to you when you're walking on this journey to actually help you to actually. So what actually tends to happen when you've identified the right problem and you now have answered the question, who am I? And you actually walk, begin the steps of walking this journey. People and resources now, they may not be, they may not be fully what you need at the right time, but you, you find a way to actually receive the help that you need at key intervals along the way. And you actually now start to actually, people now start to reckon. And you are actually growing on that journey. And you start to uh, interact with people who can actually, actually help you to actually realize aspects of what it means to actually now tackle that problem. So, uh, um, so I can just, 
coming yeah. there. I mean, if I understand, if I understand correctly, it's, it's okay. really about the creating <clears throat> networks, and it's also about the fact that there are networks similar to Nsapo's network that she's formed, um, similar to your net. They they do exist around around us and around in, in communities. Maybe it's just yeah. About you may not yeah. You may not be seeing them. You know, you may not be seeing them. But by beginning the journey, you you they actually get you attract them. You attract them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, I'm just I'm just looking at our time. I feel like there's so much more to add. Um, uh, just remember, please, everybody out there, it's on it's on the screen. Hashtag Impact Africa Summit 2020. <laughs> Share it on your platform. Um, comment on it. You're welcome to keep um, the conversation I... going. Like I it's coming. Yes, yes, yes. Can, Nsapo, can you're, I say you're something? Uh, yes, I think Nsapo, you you'll say something um, quickly. So if I, I could just maybe have a minute. On. Yes, a minute from Nsapo and a minute from Daniel. What, yeah, one minute. Just to, okay. But just to answer um, Sarah's question, I think because most of the time we get stuck at how do I start. So what I found and what happens was that you do the research, you get a solution that is well and clear. But what's also important is also finding out um, the people that are around you. So you first check with the people that are close to you. You build that social capital. And then as, as uh, Yame said, when you come up with those solutions, the users will conspire for you to to, to explain them. But I think my advice would be to say that you need to start because most of our African countries, they do not have legislation that speaks to our nation. I think for me, the reason why I founded SARS was to create a community of social entrepreneurs so that we can speak in one voice and advocate that this is how social entrepreneurs can actually develop, um, can actually advance development and actually improve the, the lives of people. So I think she, she just needs to start, look at the problem, and then devise a solution for it. Thank you. Thank you, Sapo. Yes, Daniel, one minute from you as well. If there's one burning one I want to put to all of you before, before we part ways today. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, um, I think in answering our question, one of the things she has to start with is um, stakeholders involvement. You have to reach out to these people that you want to um, to change something. You need to ask questions. Don't just assume you know what the problem is because that was the thing that happened to us in 2015. We thought we were solving the right problem until we started asking questions. So I feel the first step is you need to identify the problem, right? Which is what you've done, brilliant. The second the second thing you need to do is talk to the community members, talk to the leaders in these communities, the, the adults, the children, talk to everyone, get to know their opinions around this problem. That way you can be able to make calculated moves and ensure you are delivering the right solution. And when you're doing this, you have to definitely know what your solution is, when will the solution come in place, when you have to understand that social entrepreneurship is all about future projections. You you have to think in terms of long term, but while thinking in terms of long term, you have to think where you are right now. So it gets to do with, in starting up, the first thing I would advise is talk to people in the community, get to know their points. If you've been able to do this, don't think in terms of numbers. Don't think in terms of numbers. Don't think that I want to reach out to 1 million people. I want to reach out to 500 people. Change making journey begins with one person. It begins with one change. So see yourself as a single individual starting a movement. If one person can reach one, that becomes two. If two can reach four, four can reach eight, eight can reach 16. That's how you grow. So you have to start from where you are, ask questions, make sure you're solving, you're bringing the right solution to the right people. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I'm, the conversation this, this this afternoon is so passionate. It's absolutely amazing. Um, there's one question that I wanted to put out there. I don't know if we have enough time, but maybe we can just have 30 second answers from everybody on the panel. The ideal lending financial of ideal funding uh, and financial landscape for social entrepreneurs. Which in which way? Maybe even just a sentence or two. In which way do you think? Um, the, the private sector can now step up. I mean, let's, let's, and also government, we, we believe their value is to ensure that they're creating policy reform that allow that a conducive environment. But the funding one has always been the burning. And I'm putting it last. It's I, We can go on forever on this one. But in, in if you put, give me just one sentence each or one and a half sentences, in which, in which way do you think the private sector can now come up 
also because I feel like that's one area that now needs to start supporting social entrepreneurs. Your views, okay. please. One one and a half sentence each. Please, one, one and you can you can you can go ahead, Oliver. Sure. Fun, so, if you um, want, yeah. Go ahead, Oliver, if you want. To answer that, I think that <laughs> private, I strongly believe that private sectors should design corporate social responsibility plans in all their policies. So in as much as you're making enough of money, your organization should have impact in the social enterprise world, in change world. So every organization, every private organization should be able to give this amount of money, this amount of product, this amount of effort, to changing their communities, changing their worlds. For example, where, 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 when I started doing um, research, I found companies in these remote communities. Firstly, those companies are affecting the climate of those communities, and they are also affecting and taking jobs from those people in communities because they're now bringing in new machines. They're not actually using the two sets of the people in the communities. So there should be policies and there should be social responsibility plans that ensures that private entities helps any community they are in and then different communities as well because they have the capacity they have the network too so for example if you're producing capacity capacity i'm leaving it at there I'm, I, I'm picking up capacity metrics and we've got it remember one and a half sentence please everybody can i go to you um oh um, you just find us one sentence please one sentence i, 30, I love everybody. this question thank you for thinking oh Go, oh, go right so ahead. For me, yes. the, has, yes, the private sector has the money to actually invest in these um, in these social enterprises, but also they need to then understand that it's not only about the profits that they're gonna get, but it's more about the social aspect of it. I think when we talk about supporting social entrepreneurs, it's not only the monetary benefits need. You need to to the market. We need the information in order for sustainable. So I think the, the private sector has a huge role to play, especially in transforming how the business um, sector is. But also it's up to the government to promote such legislations that are going to support social equity and not without having an impact or actually. I think there's a, a huge role that the corporate sector can spend in um, sharing knowledge or in terms of injecting financial resources in the startup social entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you, Ntapo. Thank you, Olya Um, one, one, one and a half sentence, please. I'm now giving everybody 15 seconds just to respond. How can the corporate sector please step up in, 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 in empowering social enterprises? Where do you think you need it? So first, let me apologize. My network keeps stripping off. I have had yes, to change bye. locations like four times. and. And it's okay. a bit noisy where I am. But I think what I can say about great organizations is basically, um, you know, working with social enterprises to engage governments for better policies, but importantly, providing um, funding and resources. So sometimes when you ask for resources, people imagine they are asking for money, but no access to our entrepreneurs who can share in practical examples of how they've grown their businesses, um, who can also link you with um, non-equity and equity funders that can help, you know, social entrepreneurs. I'm really sorry, it's really noisy where I am. Who can help social enterprise, uh, sorry, <laughs> entrepreneurs expand their businesses. So I think that's, you know, a key role that corporate, corporate organizations can play in helping social entrepreneurs. Sorry for the noise, guys. I'm really sorry. It's okay, we heard you. Yami? Just now, I think you've got 15 seconds as well. Yeah, I, I just wanted to just touch on the point that she's wrote because that's the really important point. We have to gather evidence of what what impact is being made because social enterprises are a bit different for for profit because there is that mission or impact. As so, they need corporates need to to be given or supported with understanding how to measure impact. But more importantly, it's around. I think for me, it's the real issue. How do we aggregate? all the goodwill that corporates want to give because they do have the funds but you need an intermediary which is then the aggregator bringing all these corporates together so that their funding or their resources are now thematic and that's what's missing in most countries that there's no intermediary and, sitting there to, and, to be entrusted with receiving all this goodwill and i'll leave it there intermediary we have to consolidate daniel um i'm, I'm not leaving you out of this conversation i believe i you 
I've heard so much passion coming from you. Um, it's uh, um, um, this specific one. I just really want to thank everybody. Thank you so much. This has been such a vibrant session. So much passion from our different panelists. Thank you also to the attendees for, for the comments that you've had. Just maybe summing them up for everybody. There's been such a passionate uh, group of young people, such passionate entrepreneurs. You know, you've been really getting high fives on the, the passion that's resonating from you. And I think that's that's quite evident. You can't do something if you, if, if, if you don't feel it. So thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our speakers for taking the time to share um, this webinar, Kickstart of Impact Africa with us. On that note, thank you and I and, and take care. Um, and, and, and in closing from, from, from my end, uh, I would like to then say to all the attendees that joined us today, to our fantastic panelists that joined us to say today, you saw the passion, you saw the commitment, you, you heard everything. And I think we talked about it. Please, Impact Africa Summit, we're coming. This is the first one and it was absolutely phenomenal what a bomb what a bomb and expect many many more of this and a lot of the areas that we've talked to today we will be unpacking them and soon we'll be talking about the 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 impact of, of private sector. We'll be talking about the impact of policy. It's coming. Hashtag Impact Africa Summit 2020. Please, if you want to go to the website, impactafricasummit.net, look up, register, look at what's coming your way. Thank you. Thank you, attendees. Thank you, speakers. And on that wonderful note, it's thank you from Ashoka and also a thank you from British Council for a lovely webinar that we've had today and for joining us. God bless and see you in the next webinar in January.